So we're going to, on the count of three, shout out, hallelujah. Even the least animated amongst us, we're just going to let her rip. But you don't have to. Ready? One, two, three. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Our God is good. God bless all the children. I think time to head off. Be blessed. Bless the teachers and the leaders. We welcome you this morning. There may be visitors amongst us. Who's, who is here for the first time and been brought with family or friends? I know you're from Albany. God bless you. Welcome. Who else is a visitor this morning? I've seen you before, dear. Okay, fantastic. Nice to have you, ladies there. Pray that you're blessed. Yeah, of course. Wonderful. And are you from Sierra Leone mm-hmm. as well? No doubt. Married. From? I'm married. Kenya. Okay. Very welcome this morning. David's wife. David's wife, yeah. And uh, just come and say hello to the people. Brother Julian, we've only met Julian in the last few days, but he's from Sierra Leone, lives in London, and um, the Lord sent him to the nations and he's just moving through Perth. So we met and I'm going to get him to share just a little testimony of resurrection life because he's come from the Muslim world and he's come right into Jesus in a most powerful way. I thought that would be a good testimony this morning. So we want to give this morning, this is for kingdom purposes, as many who'd like to, no compulsion that we sow into the kingdom and God will multiply that seed as revival starts to take hold of the city. Hallelujah. So welcome. Let's give. Reminders that we're here every first and third. Now this is such an anomaly. We say it and then there's always you know, exceptions to the rule because today's the fifth in Resurrection Sunday. But next week we're back because it's the first Sunday of April. So the first and the third in April. But, but hold on to it. In May it's the second and the third. <laughs> the reason being that the Orthodox community had their Easter later than the, that which we celebrate and they're here on the first week in May. It's their building they get the preference and so on. That first Sunday of May, we're not here. Just sort of register somewhere. Next week's notices will have it all there for you. It's the second and third in May. But next Sunday, April 1st and then the third. Even I find hard to keep up with it. But every Wednesday, every Friday, hallelujah. We had an awesome Friday night, good Friday night. During the afternoon, the Lord said, this is going to be a Good Friday, and it was a really good Friday. The anointing was so powerful, so rich. Well, God doesn't change, and if our faith is stirred today, then let's believe God for signs and wonders, healings and miracles, even this morning. Anyone in for a miracle this morning? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Glory Camp, first weekend in June. Time to register, just so that we have an assurance the place is going to be filled for catering purposes and so on. So... Forms are available at the desk there. There's CDs available of the recent healing school. They're available, I think they're at the back this time, aren't they? David, DVD, sorry, of the healing week school, six-week healing school. And Veronica is at the book desk over there, or she will be, and uh, she'll be signing her copies of her book, excellent book, <laughs> and uh, up to the service. Please avail yourself of that. Anything else, Bill? I've forgotten anything. Amen. Resurrection Sunday. Of course, as believers, tomorrow have a guess what? Resurrection Monday. Tuesday. Resurrection Tuesday. We live in the power of the resurrected life. We celebrate today because I think it's just good to stop and say, well, Lord, thank you that as the world on this day remembers, we too remember, but we remember every day and uh, we don't celebrate the pagan roots of what the world calls Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we're very focused on that. If someone happens to give you a chocolate Easter egg, I don't think it's going to really cause a big problem. Some people are really hung up about these things but we just need to focus on the resurrection and you can celebrate whichever way you like from that point the central point is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus and right across this city there are people worshipping this morning 
There are people attending meetings that normally wouldn't go and I'm praying that the Spirit of God would fall on the churches everywhere this morning and the truth of the Gospel would penetrate hearts and minds. Would you agree with that this morning? They say 20% of people in Perth will be in church today. Well, I mean, it's not a majority, but it's, not, it's getting there. It's getting there. I'm, I'm saying 20%, Lord, next year, 30%, 40%. In revival, the majority of people will be God-conscious. And when we're God-conscious, we are Jesus-focused. We're not amongst those who say, well, God, whatever form, whatever shape, whatever likeness, we say, God, in Christ. We as Christians are very firm about that that we are God-focused but we are Christ-centred and we are Christ-informed. We, we don't just sort of have this nebulous picture of who th- this Christ is. We know who he is because he has revealed himself to us by the Spirit. And there's a great unveiling of Christ about to come forth in this city and it's an unveiling of Christ through the body of Christ. When the body of Christ has, has moved into the, the higher realms of glory, God is going to unveil us and we're going to be seen to be that supernatural crowd. Where people are going to say, where have they come from? Well, we've been in the quarry getting prepared. God's been using his word like a hammer and he's been shaping us and moulding us and making us. You know, we are created to be in the image and in the likeness of God. Uh, the word image is, the, is like a word that you would use in photography. When the image is taken, it's an exact representation of the shape and the form. Mankind is different from every other of the created order because we're formed and made in the very image, the very, the very nature of who God is. And, and it's important that, that that aspect of who we are is seen, that we are in the image of God. But to have maximum effect, we must be in the likeness of God. And in the likeness of God as we're partakers of divine nature so that when people look at the glorious church they'll see both the image and they'll see both the likeness of God. That'll be the final ultimate witness throughout the nations, this glorious church arising. And when we shared with our brother about what's happening in Sierra Leone and other nations of how revival is sweeping and and I'm sure he'll share a bit this morning but nations that were once 90% Muslim you know, as the Spirit of God comes and moves now, and particularly where our brother ministers, there's now more Christians than others. We, 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 we're going to catch up. You know, 20%, people say, well, that's a good number. No, it's not enough. There needs to be 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80% of our people worshiping Jesus. They don't have to be in a formal setting like this, but their hearts do need to be Christ-centred. Yeah? Christ-informed so that the very image of God and the likeness of God is seen through our land. Hallelujah. Excited this morning. God is for us and if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. So as we focus on resurrection, I'm going to actually ask you to share with people around you, what what does it mean to you? I mean really, what does it mean to you? The resurrection life of Christ. Have a little chat. But a very focused chat. The resurrection. I believe it's the very least that is required of the church that we are able to intelligently discuss the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After all, it's only a sincere Christian, the one who belongs to God, that believes that Jesus is bodily resurrected. There will be many who spiritualise it, even from pulpits this morning, and they'll talk about the, the concept of resurrection in a spiritual sense but only those who truly have a revelation of who Jesus is understand the bodily resurrection of Christ. And it's very important for us as Christians because our, our faith rests on this fact of the resurrection. We don't have a valid argument that Jesus is the Son of God if in fact, like many other religious leaders, he's still in a grave somewhere. We need to not only be informed about it, we should be able to give a voice to it because there are many who are searching for this unknown God. There are many who today would still be God conscious but not Christ centred, not Christ informed, not Christ focused. It's not that they're bad people but they haven't had that revelation and that's the anointing primarily upon your life and my life. Luke 4.18 Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord's upon me that I could preach this gospel. The anointing upon my life is so I can speak it out, declare it, proclaim it amongst men. 
And so this morning it's good for us to just be stirred up a bit about why we believe the resurrection, what it means for us as, as Christians and why we're different from every other person in the sense that now with the resurrection power we're being recreated into the likeness. We have the form of God, every human being does, but now the likeness of God. And that's what's going to convince our world that people who were once in, in debt are now blessed. Those who were once dying are now alive. Those who were sick are healed. That kind of testimony. And we're going to hear more and more about the testimonies that God is doing all over the, the earth. A couple of things I want to say before we do that. Number one, Romans chapter 1 verse 4. If we can either have it on the overhead there or if you'd like to look at the scriptures. Starting in verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised by the prophets in the scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Here we have an imperative as to why the resurrection is real because it's number one, it gives validity and it declares therefore that this Jesus who is of the seed of David is the Son of God. The resurrection is God's vindication of who Jesus is. Christ declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. Now if you trace back the scriptures leading to this point, death and the resurrection of Jesus, we find that Jesus has already had a, a long process of getting to this place and it was before the eyes of the whole world. You know, God loves a public declaration of uh, who Jesus is. He loves us giving witness to those who don't believe. It really honours God when this is, uh, uh, is not a church that hides but a church that is the salt and the light. God is really pleased when we are publicly declaring. If you look back into the story of this uh, leading up to his death and resurrection, Jesus has already been brought before two courts. According to the scripture, he came before the religious court of the Jewish council. And this was a, a, a public spectacle because the whole custom of the day was uh, that this Jewish court had authority, tremendous authority, over not just the religious affairs but the civic affairs of life. And Jesus, before all of the laws of the land, religious and secular, he was brought before them to give an account of who he was. Secondly, he was brought before the secular court of the Roman governor and stood before Pontius Pilate. Again, the whole religious world and the whole secular, unbelieving world of the Roman government uh, were, were pres present as Jesus came and was questioned and accused and both of these courts, the religious and the secular, rejected the claim that Jesus was the Son of God and therefore condemned him to death. Now this to me takes on a new meaning that this is a public forum. This is a religious forum, it's a secular forum, it's before the eyes of the whole world. Even the, the media of the day, the communication systems of the day would have focused upon this man says he is Christ, that he is the Son of God. And the de demonic powers using the civil as well as the religious were tearing him apart, condemned him to death. Both courts united in seeking to prevent the breaking of the grave. There was an agreement. First there was an agreement from uh, the religious leaders that that grave would be the tomb that was sealed in such a way that it was impossible for anyone to remove the body and totally impossible for anybody in the tomb to get out of that tomb. It was sealed in such a way that there was no possible way that that could be moved. But from a secular point of view, the Roman government said, and we will assign so many soldiers to stand around, trained and, uh, and uh, disciplined, and they will stand to make sure that there is no attempt in any way to disguise what's happening that this Jesus condemned to die in fact is dead and the whole world the religious world and the secular world had agreed together through the demonic this is the end of this man who calls himself the Christ 
And when I saw it like that, I realised how all the courts of heaven and how all the hosts of hell and how all the eyes of the world this weekend are going to be focused on this same Christ. Men will have different opinions as to what it means. Many would say he's dead. Many would hope that he's dead. But there will be a remnant of people who've got something in their heart. Is this the Son of God? We were at a cafe, I said it on Friday, we were at a cafe the other day. Couldn't help but overhear the people at the next table having a conversation about their understanding of Easter. I thought, well, at least they're thinking about it. And the gentleman was adamant that Jesus must have died on Thursday night because Thursday night to Friday to Saturday to Sunday is three days. And I mean, it wasn't a deeply passionate conversation, but there was this consciousness in the spirit realm of this same Jesus just doesn't go away. It's by the anointing of God, people begin to be drawn again into this same truth. And she's, she was thinking traditionally, well, no, no, it's Friday. You know, the day, the preparation for the Sabbath, Jesus died. And then there was the Sabbath. And then the first day of the week, and he's going in his head, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, not three days, only two days. He must have died Thursday. Now, my head was almost in a spaghetti bowl by now because I'm sort of really, really wanting to say something. And the Lord, of course, reminding me, as I said on Friday, that in the Jewish calendar, the first day is day one. The second day, the Sabbath, is day two. The first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, was day three. So, in fact, the scriptural account is true, three days. But the Western mindset's trying to work it out. And I thought, at least he's thinking. At least he's talking. The civil courts, uh, the civil world, uh, the secular world, the religious world, even the church world today where people would deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus and would just, just begin to spiritualise all these things. But in the midst of all that, God who is God of all, it's a wonderful declaration of truth here that on the third day God had promised to intervene. Now they're all watching. As far as they're concerned, it's a done deal. Condemned to death, he's gone tomb is sealed, no one can touch it, legions of soldiers all scattered around just to make sure and then on the third day God intervened. Praise God that he intervenes in human affairs. The seal was just simply broken. That which absolutely put that stone in such a position that it could not be moved, totally snapped by the power of God. Thirdly it says the guards were fearful and paralysed it says they were thrown back in fear. They were paralysed under the power of God. They were no longer powerful men. And Jesus came forth from the tomb. At that point, God was reversing the decisions of both man and devil. Doesn't matter what he decided. Doesn't matter the demonic influence on the hearts and minds of men. God just simply intervened. And he overthrew the whole thing. And he reversed the decision, publicly vindicated that this same Jesus is truly the Son of God. So it's important that you and I cling to the scripture that this is the declaration that Jesus is the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Secondly, I've just got two, three points. Secondly, Romans 4.25. Romans 4.25 start in verse um, maybe 23 they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four footed beasts and creeping things wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonour their own bodies between themselves they changed the truth of God into a lie and they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. That's Romans 1. I'm glad you enjoyed that scripture. <laughs> Romans 4:25, Verse 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offence but was raised again for our justification. Romans 4:25. Christ was 
delivered up because of our offences and he was raised because of our justification. This means that the resurrection is the sure seal upon God's offer of forgiveness to the human race. If God had offered forgiveness, and most religions do offer a form of forgiveness, it's not the complete forgiveness as a Christian would understand, but they would appease to the conscience of men, they would cause them to do certain things so that they can, uh, you know, let the, 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 the sin of the past be taken care of. Uh, but for the believer, the promise of forgiveness is sealed by the resurrection of Jesus. It says here, because he was raised up because of our justification, because God in his heart had already justified the human race as if they hadn't sinned, because before the foundation of the world, this Lamb of God, he became sin. He was, before the foundation of the world, destined to die and to bury, be buried with the sin in hell and be raised on the third day. Because of our justification, even though our understanding is it's for our justification, the fact is in the heart of God, before the foundation of the world we were saved, he says because he says that they will be justified, he must raise Jesus from the dead as the evidence, as the proof that what he's promised, he's now sealed to us forever by the resurrected life of Christ. So it's not only a public witness that this Jesus is the Son of God, it's also a witness to our, uh, our own Christian faith that the price has been paid, the penalty has been paid, the power has been broken of sin because of our justification in the heart and the mind of God and now fulfilled in Jesus. So the resurrection is a sure seal upon God's offer of forgiveness and full salvation to all who put their trust in him alone. Romans 10, 9 and 10 talks about with the heart man believes and with the, the tongue confession is made unto salvation. This is only possible because Jesus is raised from the dead. Verse 10, for with the heart man believes into righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Without the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, there is no salvation. There may be a promise of salvation, but there's no salvation. Do you know people that we witness to from other world religions, they have a hope in their heart that they would be, inverted commas, saved. They may not use that word, certainly not the way we understand that word. But there is a desire in every human heart that we would be released from the bondage of this present time. There is a sense of one day maybe somehow we'll reach the state of nirvana. Somehow, some way we will reach this utopia. Somehow, some way we will improve. So many people in self-help courses. I know people who spend tens of thousands of dollars trying to improve their broken self. You can't improve a broken self. That broken self has to be just reckoned as dead so we can have a new self. I feel so sad for people trapped in all these different New Age type activities but their sincere heart is that I might be changed, that I might be better, that I might reach this kind of state. Only the Christian has the assurance that because Jesus has died for us and forgiveness is now sealed to us that we can be saved because of his resurrection. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's why we're celebrating this morning in Philippians chapter 3, final point, Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Here the Apostle Paul with great passion. He, I mean, he, when we meet him, we will find the passion that burned in this man. The one who once persecuted Christians was so incredibly saved by the power of Jesus. He was radically changed forever. I question sometimes our own depth of salvation when some of us don't change easily. We ought to be totally different from what we used to be. That ought to be the fruit of the saved life. I remember when we were in fact in Kenya, my dear, this is many years ago, we were in Kenya, Nairobi, and we were in some ministry areas. And one song that impacted me was this, is tens of thousands of beautiful Christians singing the things I used to do, I do them now no more. Tears pouring down their faces. These are former animists. These are some of them, those who were in witchcraft. These are those who are former witch doctors. These are some, just some, not everyone was doing all of that, but they are the prevailing spirits. Tears pouring down their face. The things I used to do, I do them now no more. The things I used to say, I say them now no more. The one I used to be, I'm not like that anymore. And the impact of that simple 
possibly even a Sunday school song, was burned in my heart. And I thought, oh God, I wish, I wish, I wish that every believer in the Western world would say, I once was that, but now I'm that. I once was blind, but now I see. That we have this terrible thing of trying to add Jesus to all that we've already done. We value these things that we have taken from the secular world. We value that which is even demon-inspired, but it's culturally relevant. And we bring it in and we sort of add Jesus, hoping that he'll fit somewhere in the mix. He doesn't fit in any mix. He doesn't fit in any mix. He says, you're being recreated. You've got the form so everyone knows what God is is like that form of God, invisible, but that's the form of the Father, revealed fully in Jesus, the perfect man. Do you know there is a perfect man in heaven? Even though we say he is God, and clearly he is God, but Timothy says there's a perfect man in heaven, the man, Jesus Christ. And so when you and I are changed to be in the likeness of him, the same nature, the word, bringing divine life into us, that people look and say, It's not only the form of God, but oh, it's the likeness of God. Why? Because the things we used to do, we do them now no more. By the power of the resurrection. And so Paul had this passion. His new life was so passionate. He said, I don't understand why, but I was the chief of sinners, but now I'm the chief apostle. Incredible favour that comes with the resurrection of Christ. But Philippians 3, 10 to 12 getting so excited I'm forgetting the scripture. Paul says that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, there it is again, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death. If by any means that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already attained, either or already perfect, but I follow, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. Here we have this incredible, powerful statement from the Apostle Paul who had maximum revelation of truth. It says there are two things. Because of the power of resurrection I can know him, number one, and two, that by any means I might attain, I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. I believe that Paul is saying that with all that we do and all that we say and all that we achieve in this life there is a focal point that should be ahead of us that culminates all the efforts all the energy, all the motivating things that cause us to live and that culminating point is this, that I might be raised from the incorruptible body into a corruptible body into incorruption He says, this is the greatest goal and the greatest desire of my heart that nothing in this world is going to get in the the place of stopping me achieving this ultimate goal that I might be raised from the dead. Even as we are spiritually, we are spiritually raised from the dead now, seated in heavenly places, but that bodily we too will be raised from the dead and forever be with the Lord with glorified bodies Who wants a glorified body? Who needs a glorified body? Who's sagging in the wrong places? Who just wants to have the glory of God forever change them? It's a a valid desire. Paul says that of all that's happened to me and all the labour and all the effort and all the preaching and all the teaching, he says that I might attain it, that I might grab it, apprehend it. That's what I'm aiming for that the full salvation, my spirit is saved, my soul is being saved and my body will be saved. You know, salvation is a process. It started with the new birth, the rebirth of the human spirit. It continues with the sanctification, the changing of the soul, the word working in the soul, healing, delivering, restoring. But then finally, the body will be fully glorified and will be raised to eternity. This is not a little thing for the Christian faith. This is not a little focus that we sort of tack on. Sometimes we don't even talk about it in case it embarrasses the world. But you know what? The world would want to know what we really believe. That we've got a wonderful down payment already and that we've already got the spirit living within us but oh boy does it get better as we go on. The world thinks that Christianity is going to be eternal church services. 
No wonder they don't want to come around us. They go, you've got to be kidding. Forever, in the cloud, with a harp, singing, Yes, Jesus loves me. They're horrified by the thought. And to be quite honest, so am I. Because when we are raised to be with him, that which we are perfecting in the spirit will be done spirit, soul and body. We will reign with him over the whole created universe. We will rule, we will reign. You are created to reign. You and I are created to rule. We are created to be ahead and not the tail and above and not beneath. There's something within every one of us that yearns to be the leader. Something within us that yearns to, to, to have dominion over circumstances. It's, 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 the, it's the likeness of God that's in us. It's the God part in us. God is not ruled by even the, the whole Jewish council. He's not ruled by the whole Roman Empire. He says, make your plans, devil, and all earth you can agree with them. But on the third day, as I've already spoken, I'm just going to intervene. I'll break the seal. I'll paralyse the entire army and I'll raise him from the dead and he will walk forth in your midst because as God has said it, it's going to happen. And so resurrection for us is not some little little soft, sort of sweet little powerless little image that we hope might work. We've been transformed into the God kind of people. We're going to do great exploits. And Brother Julian, you want to say something? Because we want you to. You've had experiences that some of us haven't had and you've been to places that we haven't been. Praise the Lord. We normally say hallelujah. Some life. Amen. Yeah. Name is Julian Khan. Senior pastor of Mercy Mission. But I wasn't born with that name. I was born with the name Mohammed Al-Hajj Takiu Khan the second. My father is still an imam, which is a reverend in the Islamic faith. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to shout that. Say hallelujah. Every time you say hallelujah, angels react to it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Right. I'm not here to glorify Islam. I'm here to glorify Jesus. Because it's only by His grace I am standing before you. I'm privileged to be here. I really appreciate God to be in the midst of people like you. Praise the Lord. And so my father and his father and his father's father... Going on to the fifth generation, we're all imams. I was born that way. Raised that way. But some things used to happen to me that made me question my faith. And I didn't quite understand it until actually when I became a young adult. Sometimes I would rebel, I would hide, I wouldn't go to the mosque. It's compulsory. You have to go there. You have to learn everything by heart. And you have to be beaten if you choose not to do it. You will be punished. So I learned the Quran by heart. Every verse is in here. From Bismillah to Tabara is here. I know the interpretations of it. And I know the Arabic readings of it. Praise the Lord. And so, one day, I was praying. It started like this. This is how it started, residually, bit by bit. I was praying. The moment I stood to say that name, which I can't say here, because the Muslims have their God, the Christians have their Most High God. You can't understand it unless you're saved. When you are there, you think they are the ones that are right. That's how we were taught. To believe that Christians are infidels. That's how we were taught. We were brainwashed. 
And I have to confess to you, nobody's preached to me to convert me because it was impossible for somebody to convert me. I'm not saying anything out of context here. I'm saying the truth. Praise the Lord. So, the first time it started, I became a little bit scared. I stood on my prayer mat and I wanted to do, I've done the ablution, everything, and I saw the cross. Jesus is alive. 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 Now, I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke. I don't take anything that will defile my body. I'm not in the least condemning anybody here. If anybody is in that situation, I encourage you in Jesus' name to just seek his face. And you will be saved in Jesus' name. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That particularly not walk not by the flesh but by the spirit. So that's not what I'm here to do. I'm just telling you exactly how I became saved. Amen? Amen? Good. What a great church. I saw the cross. I saw the cross. And I stopped. I didn't pray the Muslim prayer. That's how it started. And so I was pondering what was that. I looked on my right, I looked on my right and left, and I saw the wall, so I wasn't actually crazy. The cross was there. So the cross was telling me, this is not the way. Not in audible words, but in, you know, you just know. That he's trying to tell you, no, this is not the way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So I stopped praying for some days and I was really, really punished by my parents. And uh, I couldn't tell them because, you see, they wouldn't believe me. Because somebody was telling me, somebody was talking to me. I couldn't see the person, but I could hear a voice saying that they ain't going to believe you. They would think you've gone bonkers. Walking by faith requires you to not look at what people or hear or listen to what people think. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Walking by faith means that you have to listen to the voice of the Lord. Because He will only tell you good things. He will not tell you bad things. He will only lead you. How be it in John chapter 16. How be it that when the Spirit of the Lord comes, He will guide you into all truths. Amen. So, the moment I started having that experience, I withdrew. And then, later on, I started, because when I'm going to pray, I'll make sure that it's not me alone, because I might see that cross. So, I'll make sure I'm in, in between people. But even when I'm in the gathering with multitudes of people, I'd still be distracted because I thought I'm going to see the cross. I ignored it for some time, and I went to Africa to do humanitarian work, good things. After the war in Sierra Leone, I wanted to give back to my people and just encourage them. I said, maybe if I go there to do something good, this cross will leave me. Not knowing that, this cross was after me for good. Somebody say, Hallelujah! Eventually, some very bad things happened to me in Sierra Leone. I had to return back to England, and everybody involved were imams, uh, Islamic heads. And I went to my little um, living room in Camberwell, that's southeast London. And I said something. It was like a prayer, but a very dangerous prayer. I said this. This is exactly what I said to God. I said, I don't know you. I don't know whether you are a Christian God or you are a Muslim God. I don't know who you are. But what I know, that you exist and you have to reveal yourself to me. If you don't reveal yourself to me, I'm going to stay right here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to church. I'm not going to mosque. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'll stay right here until you reveal yourself to me. Praise the Lord. 
And within seconds, now what you're going to hear from now on is going to change your lives. Praise God. It's going to change the lives of your loved ones. If you have anyone that is lost in the worldly ways, don't give up. We're going to claim them back in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? This place, this place where we are, this area of Australia, God has earmarked this place as his sanctuary. On Friday, I'm going to come back. You know, go this way, come back. Go this way, come back. And I have about 10 minutes and I'm going to conclude. Praise the Lord. On Friday, while we were worshipping, I normally close my eyes. I'm not sleeping. But I'm in the spirit. So I closed my eyes and I saw angels dropping down from heaven. Surrounded this whole place. On Friday, we were here in the evening. And uh, I saw a king sitting on a chair. I believe his name is Jesus. He had a crown on his head. And there was massive light protruding from the, cr- from the throne right into the service. And he didn't come in. He was right there, up there. The angels hovering around the building and the light penetrating right into the service. You're in the right place. You're in the right church. Church that walk by the Spirit. That's the church of Jesus. After I said, I am not going anywhere, I'm not going anything, I'm not going to worship any other way, Christian or Muslim, because I'm not even a Christian that then. I was a Muslim, a staunch Muslim. The light appeared. A few seconds later, the light appeared. I cannot in any definite, precise way describe the luminous of that light. It's in, undescribable. I couldn't see after a few seconds when the light appeared, I couldn't see anything. But I felt like I was lifted off the ground, like a massive hand was holding me. I could feel like a hand is holding me, a massive hand is holding me. And the voice, like a voice of over a thousand people or more, said, I am Jesus. He said, come to me. His presence is here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. After he said that, my whole body was trembling. I felt this, some kind of electricity, a soothing electricity in my body. The whole, every part of my body. It's like a heavy weight has been lifted up me. I couldn't feel any pain anymore because I had some pain that I was struggling with. Everything left. Ladies and gentlemen, from that day, my life changed. From darkness to light. Each day, from that fateful day for 21 days, every day I was in a university. Every night, rather, from midnight now till morning, I'll be in a study class with Jesus Christ, teaching me the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I have never been to a Bible school. Never. If you have any connection in England... You may have heard of a Muslim boy who was saved. And after being saved, it was in the news. Um, I was told to go and get some food in Peckham. Uh, That's the black area of London. And on my way to Peckham, I met with a woman I've never met. 
And she pointed at me and said, it's you. So I had five pounds in, in my pocket. Normally when people want to beg, they bring some conversation to you. So I, deep, I said, you, I only got five pounds, but you can have it. She said, I don't want your money. Then I started understanding that this woman meant business. She said, you don't even understand, do you? I said, you understand what? Then she said, Jesus. I said, oh no, you should leave me alone. This Jesus has been with me for 21 days. Why doesn't he leave me alone? Praise God. He loves you. Sometimes when you are falling away, when you're doing the wrong thing, he's still there. He loves you. He's babysitting. He's waiting for you to come back. Praise the Lord. So the woman, I thought she was joking. Another woman met me again and he said, oh, it's you. I said, what is going on here? By the time I turned around, there were over 15 people following me. Then the voice said, you think you really want to go to this place? To the supermarket? You think you really want to go there? When I said back in my heart, I said, I don't think it's a good idea. Praise the Lord. So I returned back to my flat, not knowing that the church is about to be birthed. I had no clue. You see, walk by faith. Always. Don't walk with your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Try not to lean on your own understanding. Don't come to church and when the message is read and you feel you have been condemned. No, you have not been condemned. You have been convicted. Praise the Lord. You have not been targeted. You have been redeemed. Because only by faith would you be able to walk in the Lord. His currency is faith and his product is jesus hallelujah you have jesus and you have faith you have god hallelujah hallelujah so we went in they didn't ask for my permission they pushed me in and they entered and they started praising god i had never preached before this was going to be my first preaching. With God all things are possible. Amen? Amen? They got in and somebody went on the phone and started calling and I could hear this conversation. People started calling other people say, please come, something is happening here. There's a Muslim boy, God has saved him and something is happening. There is the anointing in this place. Bring your husband. The husband is a former principal of a secondary school who was paralyzed in a wheelchair. So bring your husband. Something will happen here. We believe God is doing something here. And I haven't got permission from the local council to do a church in my flat. My neighbors are gone bonkers and now they have reported me to the council and say, there's too much noise next door. We don't know what's going on there. But the Holy Ghost is at work. Australia shall be saved in Jesus' name. When I like to rephrase that Australia is saved in Jesus' name. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. As long as we agree, God will agree. He always works with us. Amen. amen. Whilst we were in there praising God, I have no clue what was happening in the entrance of the flat. I was inside because the place is getting choked up. They came with this principal and uh, got into the lift came upstairs as soon as they got to the door according to the wife and the husband when they were giving their testimony he just popped out of the chair and he started walking no more what i decree in the name of jesus that whatever is wrong in your life jesus will fix it in jesus name I didn't know, I didn't pray, I didn't touch. All I know is, I saw a man who said he was crippled. It has nothing to do with me, but to God be all day, glory. Amen? And that miracle took place, 
And people started getting the understanding that yes, something is really happening there. Because God will always prove that this is his church. And on Friday when I came, I just knew I was home. It's not a strange place for me. This is home. Because where the spirit is, that's where you are. That's where you should be. Amen? I've never met, in my life, I've met a Nigerian pastor who I consider to be extremely humble. Pastor Tayo. And for that reason, I love this guy so much that, because I had a preconceived ideology about, um, you know, Nigerians because of what you hear in the news, what you read and all these things. But when I met this guy, my perception changed. And I convicted myself that, you, you know, I have no right to prejudge anybody. I have no right to do that. Because this guy, his attitude towards me and his, his humbleness just made me feel I have been wrong about every Nigerian I come across. Because Sierra Leone is a small country, so um, when the war took place, a lot of Nigerians came in and they taught them so many things. We didn't know much about fraud. People couldn't lock their doors or cars. But now, don't leave anything on your, in your car. You will meet it there again. And in fact, if you park your car in a place where it, you don't have people watching it, you will meet it there again. So it became so, and everybody was blaming it on the Nigerians. We all had that perception. And so I rebuked myself for that and I said, I was wrong. Not because the devil has sent some few bad apples to cause problems, means that anyone had the right to change the law of God in order to please the enemy. Hallelujah. That's happening in Australia right now. It's happening. God didn't make a man for a man. He made a man for a woman. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm here. I'm, I have the right to say that. That's what the Bible said. Amen. But I learned one thing. When Jesus saved me, started his church, and sent me to Africa, he didn't say go with loads and loads and loads of wealth. He just said go. There's one thing about God when you believe him. You have, you have a church where the couple, when I met them, I, said, I have to confess this pastor. I told Jesus, I said, I thought these people were come in a limousine. Now that's me. Hallelujah. But when I saw them, the Spirit spoke to me and said, This is exactly how I want you to behave. As humble as they are. Hallelujah. No, I am not that humble. Hello. I'm not. You want the truth? That's the truth. When I go to Sierra Leone, I expect somebody to wash my car. I do these things because... This is how we were raised. But Jesus said, you know, you can't do what you want to do all the time. You're going to have to do what I want you to do. So this morning, I have to send you to another church that don't quite understand who I am. I want you to go and talk to somebody there. So he woke me up and he said, you're going to have to walk. And every step you take, you will plead my blood in this area. Because there are things happening here that I need you to bind. Praise the Lord. So I walked around a church. I don't know if I'm allowed to name the church, but I went to a church, a big church, down my area, Victoria Park. A very big church by the river. It's called Riverview. And I went there. The Lord said, you're only here to talk to one person. So I walked to this woman. I don't know who she is. I said, the Lord sent me to come and help. She said, help what? She said, I said, to help pack your chairs. But they said, I should talk to you. The concept of salvation. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? It's not entertainment. It's a relationship. You can know the name of Jesus doesn't mean you have a relationship with him. And only when you come to a place like this, then you begin to have an intimacy with him. Because you see, he has to have his self, himself in you. His DNA. 
DNA in you. His spirit in you. Without his spirit we are empty. So the Lord used me to say something to this lady. And she started sobbing. We hugged. And I went and did my job. I packed the chairs. By the time they could get me. To sit down or to talk to their pastor. He said run away as fast as you could. You're not here to talk to anybody. Praise the Lord. I packed the chairs and I ran away. I did. I ran away. I wasn't there to wait for any compliment. Praise the Lord. God sent you somewhere. Go there. Do what he wants you to do. Go. He pays you. He rewards you. Amen? I think I have one minute left. I went to Sierra Leone. He said, go and open a radio station. He said, this radio station is going to serve three countries. And he said, you're going to open a TV station. And this TV station is going to reveal me. The truth of the matter is, I saw a couple of people in a dream, not in a vision. There's a difference between a dream and a vision. I saw a couple of people in the dream that I have seen in Australia. On the television station. And then people were being ministered to. Now that is another testimony. Praise the Lord. To get this license in a 90% Muslim dominated country. Wasn't going to be easy when it is clearly stated Christian TV. The devil came like a brick wall and said you ain't going to have it. I said, I'm going to have it. He said, no, you can't. I said, yes, I can. He said, no, you haven't got the right. You haven't got the power. This is a Muslim country. I said, no, this is not a Muslim country. This country is owned by God Almighty. My God is bigger than your God, I said. If you want your problems to be over, big your God. Make your God big over the situation. Rather than the situation consuming you. And some people make the situation so big that they forget that they have a big God that will take care of that situation. We forbid that in Jesus' name. So, I told the, the, the people, the officials I met, I said, look, I'm going to have this. I went into three days, kneel by mouth, after which they called me. They only gave me 30 minutes to come and defend the application. And 30 minutes from where I am, so where I'm supposed to be, it's virtually impossible. So I just prayed. I said, you know, you own the street. You own everything, traffic and everything. You get me there. I don't know what I'm doing, but you know, I'm following you. So I got into my car and the traffic was just going. And he said, the route I normally take to the town was my favorite route, the wide junction on the left. And he said, no, don't take that one. Take the other one because he has a plan. God will never send you to do ministry if he hasn't put the provisions in place for you. It is your faith that ushers you to those provisions. So I took the faith walk and the man was waving. I just braked the car because I was prompted to do so. And he came in and he said, I'm going to walk. I'm go I said, where? He said, I'm going to SLBC. I said, I'm going to IMC. He said, I'll come with you. I said, well... I'm actually going for a meeting, you see, because I'm, I'm flying and, and, you know, they want an engineer. He said, I'm an engineer. Now that tells you that that's the reason why God said, take that route. Always trust in the Lord and he will provide your needs in Jesus' name. I'm going to stop here because of time. But I want to encourage you. Nothing is too hard for him to do in your life. This is a great ministry. I am, I, I am learning. I'm, I'm here to learn. The truth is, I'm here to learn how to do true Holy Ghost humble ministry. Because I'm not humble. I'm just beginning to be. Because I'm learning from your pastor. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Great testimony. 
Same God. Available vessel. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. You've encouraged, inspired, challenged, convicted, all the things that you do well. But, Lord, you're empowering us now to go back to our world, back to our sphere of influence with the same transforming grace. Thank you, Lord, that you came. Thank you that you died. Thank you that you were buried even in the depths of hell. Thank you that with all authority you rose, broke the chains of death and hell and you rose from the dead and you led captivity captive. You opened up the heavens and made a way for us to be with you forever. Father, we thank you. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to be here this morning. Father, bless our families. Father, we agree that all our loved ones are coming back to you. We agree, Father, every backslidden Christian in this region is going to come back into your love. We thank you for revival that is breaking forth, Lord, and the overflow will reach this city. Seal these things by the Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you. There will be fellowship and hot cross buns. But also I know this man is a very strong prophetic gift and if, if, would that be possible if anyone wanted some prayer this morning? He's available to pray. And if you have general prayer needs, you're welcome to come. God bless you. Have a great rest for the holiday break. Amen.